In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 2, verse 11, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, We are not unaware of the devil's schemes. We are not unaware of the devil's schemes. We must be aware. We should be conscious, but not uh, you know, obsessed by the evil one's works. So, how, how do the evil one try to trap us? First of all, we must understand that Christ has given us victory over the evil one in his name. We have been delivered from the evil one and today we are in the kingdom of God. In Colossians chapter 1, 13, 14, read about how Paul writes, For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and has brought us to the kingdom of the son he loves. God has rescued us from the domain of darkness and today we are in God's kingdom. We have been rescued from the evil one. We can enjoy God's kingdom. And God's kingdom is power. God's kingdom is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And every good promise of God is our inheritance in Christ. Now, how did the evil one try to trap us? First of all, he will try to work in our minds, in our minds, in our thinking. In 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 3, the Apostle Paul is identifying the concern he had for the church in Corinth. He writes there, I am afraid that just like Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind may be somehow led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He is talking about how the evil one, the deceiver, deceives us from by uh, drawing our minds away from the Lord into other things. What happened in the Garden of Eden is very interesting that the devil never tells Eve to eat from that tree. doesn't tell her to eat from that tree. He puts a question. Did God really say you must not eat from any, 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 uh, any, eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden? He says, no, God didn't say that. Of course, he did say we shouldn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. If we eat of it, if we touch it, we will die. So devil puts a question, gets an answer, then makes a statement. He says, you will not surely die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, you will be like God knowing good and evil. That's all the devil does. He puts a question, gets an answer, and makes a statement. That's all. He never tells her eat from that tree. But her mind is focused on what the devil said. You will not die. She looks at the fruit. Good for food. Pissing into the eye. And useful for getting knowledge. Till the devil spoke to her, the question of eating and not dying never arose. There's no question of eating from the tree and not die. So God told her, if you eat from the tree, the fruit, you will die. That's all she knew. Question of eating and not dying never arose. Now a new idea has come. You will not die. So he's contemplating. Will I die? Will I not die? Will I die? Will I not die? Her mind was taken away from God's word to Another possibility of eating and not dying. That's how the devil deceived her. A mind being drawn away from what God told them, Adam and Eve, to what could happen when they disobeyed God. Now, as long as your mind and my mind is upon the Lord, we'll have perfect peace. In Isaiah 26, 3, we read, Isaiah writes, you keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed upon me. When a mind is stayed upon the things of God, on the word of God, in fact, Psalm 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have they 
who love your law. Nothing will make them stumble. So we have great peace when you love God's word. We'll have perfect peace when our minds are stayed upon the Lord. In fact, peace is given to us freely in Christ. But then the evil one will not stop. He will try to distract us away from following God. Draw minds away from the Lord. We Christians are very careful about how we live. Because people can see how we live. We are very careful about what we speak. Because people can hear what we speak. We are not very careful about what we think. Because people don't know what we think. But God knows what we think. He knows our thoughts. So if we are people pleasers, we will be only concerned about you know, uh, what people can see in us, what they hear from us. If you are God pleasers, we will be as much concerned about our thinking as much as our lives. In fact, our thinking will shape our life. In the book of Proverbs, 23rd chapter verse 7, very Proverbs 23 verse 7, as a man thinks, so is he. The King James version of the Bible. As a man thinks, so is he. So it's very important for us to keep our minds upon the things of God and not get distracted. We get deceived when our minds are distracted from the pure word of God. God's word will guide us in the way we have to go. And evil one, while he cannot take away our salvation, he'll try to make our lives in this world as miserable as possible by troubling us and especially in the context of minds being drawn away from the things of God. The second method he uses is to entice us with things of this world and try to make us disobey God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says, Ephesians 2 2, how he is still at work in those who are disobedient. He is still at work in those who are disobedient. While you and me have been delivered from the evil one, we have been set free from his control, we are in the kingdom of God, yet he will try to tempt us by things of this world, deceive us. Like I told you about the Israelites who had camped on the plains of Moab in the Old Testament, how the king Barak of Moab tried to employ Balaam to put a curse on the Israelites, and he could not put a curse. Every time he tried to put a curse, the curse became a blessing. But then later on, you find the Numbers 25th chapter, how in a deceptive manner, women were sent into the camp to tempt the Israelites to worship their gods and eat food sacrifice to idols. Deception. Now, when we realize we are called to walk with God, obey Him, walk in step with the Spirit, we can recognize also the temptation the devil brings to us. In James chapter 1, 13 to 15, the Bible talks about how Christians get tempted. There, James writes, verses 13 to 15, when tempted, don't you say God is tempting me? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor is he tempted anyone. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Enticed. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Where sin is full grown, it leads to death. Here the Bible clearly talks about how Christians get tempted and sometimes yield to temptation. They get enticed. Who is the enticer? Not God. He'll never entice us. He'll never tempt us. He can't be tempted. Nor will he tempt anyone. We get tempted when by our own evil desire, the five elements, the faculties of our, of our bodies, eyes, ears, mouth, sense of touch, sense of taste, whatever. 
we get attracted to the stimulus in this world. And the evil one shows us temptations. He reveals temptation to entice us. He has no power over us unless we give him authority over us. He only show us. He showed Eve the fruit and said, you will not die. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. It is up to her to obey God or not obey God. She had a choice. She was not under the devil's control. She and Adam were free. They were free. When they ate from that tree, they and the offspring all came under devil's control. The whole world today is a prisoner of sin. But Christians who have belonged to Christ have been delivered from that. We are set free today. We are so free today, we can use that freedom to either obey God or disobey God. It's our choice. All the devil can do is to show us temptation. And sometimes does it very deceitfully and try to bring sin to life without us knowing it. In fact, sin itself is deceitful. I told you in another session about how the heart is deceitful. Heart is deceitful. But God can change our hearts completely. Sin also is deceitful. It comes into our lives sometimes without us knowing it. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, we read, Hebrews 3, 13, the writer talks about the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is still deceitful. It appears to be not sin. It is sin, appears not to be sin. That's deceit. So, sin is deceitful, a heart is deceitful, and it seems very bad, uh, bad news for us. But thank God, he gives us wisdom, discernment, counsel, for us to identify the enticement of the evil one. In this passage, third chapter of uh, James, 13 to 15, we read about how when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. It talks about conception of desire and the birth of sin. In biological terms for a human being, but in conception and birth, it's about nine months. Whereas for conception of desire and the birth of sin, depends on what kind of sin it is. But that I always tell Christians, there's one kind of abortion that God permits. The abortion of wrongful desire in our hearts before it becomes sin. When it's brewing in our hearts. That's why we have the amazing help of the Holy Spirit, who is a counselor, who will show our hearts. We shouldn't trust in our own intellect to know our hearts. We should ask God to show our hearts. In Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, we read, Psalm 139, 23 and 24, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. David writes, Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. He's asking God to show his heart. And again, some amazing news is there for us in the Bible, good news about how we can know our hearts. In Psalm 90 verse 8, this is Moses who wrote the psalm. He tells God, about God he writes, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. As you go to God in prayer and seek his counsel, in his presence, our secrets are all illuminated, exposed. So when desire is conceived, you can know it. Go to God and say, show me my heart, Lord. He will show. And then we are called to circumcise that in our hearts. It's a practical thing we have to do, constantly in God's presence. Put away anything that in our heart does not please you to him. Put it away. It doesn't become practice in our lives. That is a God-pleaser. 
a God pleaser put away sin, even before it becomes sin in practice, when it's proving in the heart. In the book of Romans, in chapter 2, verse 29, Romans 2, 29, Paul writes, Circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, it's from God. When he put away wrong things in our hearts because God reveals to us, we turn from it practically, stop thinking about it, and start thinking about what God is saying to us. God knows we're doing it because of him, not because of people. People don't even know what is in our heart. God knows our hearts. When you put away wrong things in our hearts because God knows it, God knows we're doing it to please him. And it pleases God. On the other hand, the evil one will show us temptations. He entices us with things of this world. That's why you have to consciously take our eyes away from things of this world. In Psalm 119, verses 36 and 37, we read, the psalmist writes, Turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. You know, when you keep on looking at things of this world, things of this world become our treasure. A heart becomes focused on that. A heart is where our treasure is. The treasure will be what you keep on seeing. So why is it that in a heart there are so many of these evil things? There are only 14 things I mentioned last session. How do they get there? Through the ear and through the eyes. What we see and what we hear occupies our mind. What we keep on thinking in our minds, we get into our heart. It's a practical thing. So we have to focus that our minds are away from unnecessary thoughts, only focus on God's word. In the Old Testament time, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 14, we read, the Lord says to his people, O Jerusalem, wash the sin from your heart and be saved. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? When wicked thoughts occupy the mind, not your practice in our lives, not action, not words, only thinking, from the mind it goes into the heart, the spirit. That's why scripture says, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Proverbs 4, 23 says, Guard your heart. It's a wellspring of life. Guard what goes into your heart. Filter it. It's a wellspring of life. From the heart, everything comes out. Words come out. Actions come out. So we have to be very careful about what goes into our heart. That comes from the mind. What the mind is occupied with could be based on what we see and what we hear. When you keep on hearing gossip, slander, heart is full of gossip and slander. We may be people who are not gossip mongers, not slanderers. What you keep on hearing will occupy our hearts. In Psalm 120, verse 6 and 7, we read, Psalm 126 and 7, David writes, Too long have I lived among the people who hate peace. Too long have I lived among people who hate peace. I am a man of peace. But when I speak, they are for war. I am a man of peace. Why do you speak war talk? Why do you indulge in war talk? Because too long, have a little among people who hate peace. So the company we keep is very, very important. That's why God's fellowship of God's people, fellowship of God's people is very, very vital for us to be right with God. When you keep on hearing God's word being spoken, being discussed and being analyzed and followed, then our heart is full of God's word and we can stand against the evil one. 
by faith. By faith. Now, we know about the armor of God, which is given to us, every one of us. Sixth chapter of Ephesians, verse 12 to 17, Paul speaks about the armor of God. The stand against the evil one. He'll come with the deception, he'll come with this wild schemes, he'll come with the enticing, but we can put on the armor and stand against the evil one. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, feet, gospel of peace, shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Imagine I'm standing before uh, Brother Charles. He's wearing this armor. I see helmet, breastplate, belt, shoes, shield, and sword. I'm the personal devil looking at him. He's a Christian. I'm trying how to trap him. I'm trying how to trap him. How to catch him in his weak spot. And he's got the armor on. I can't do anything. When I'm going to look at the armor, what am I scared of? I'm not scared of the helmet. It can't harm me. I'm not scared of the breastplate. It's for his protection, his chest, to protect his chest, not for me. Belt for his safety. Shoes for his comfort. Shield for his protection. But the sword, sword is a weapon of offense. Sword harms me. So I'm scared of the sword. I'm not scared of the helmet. I'm not scared of breastplate or, or belt or shoes or shield. They're for him, not for me. As the instrument of the devil, I'm giving a theoretical uh, analogy, I'm scared of the sword. Sword harms me. So I won't come against him. I won't come near him. He's got the sword. I dare not come near him. But shield and sword both go together. The shield he protects himself, the sword he harms me. So now, when you look at him, I won't dare come near him because of the sword. That's the only weapon of offense, the sword. I won't come near him. But supposing I think he's got the sword, I know he's got the sword, but he's forgotten he's got the sword. He has forgotten. Doesn't know he's got the sword. I'll come boldly. I can see the sword. He's not seeing it. He's forgotten he's got the sword. I'll come boldly before him. So, as Christians, when the evil one comes with all his guiles and all his wiles and all his deception, we tell the devil, I've got the sword. I know I've got the sword. And you better know I know I've got the sword. You won't come near me. We don't have to fight the devil. We only resist him. Kill him away. Resist him, that's all. Don't allow him to come near. Resist him. Show the shield and the sword. How do you do it practically? It's written, it's written, it's written. Quote scriptures. Scriptures hurt the devil. They grieve him. They wound him. That's why when Christians read the Bible and hear the word of God, the devil is nervous. Two things the evil one is very scared of when Christians pray and when they apply scriptures, when they read the scriptures. He's scared. You have a party, you have a, a, a lunch fellowship in the church, the devil is very happy. He also, he also joins in the lunch. He'll enjoy. Have celebration, picnics, no problem. Pure word of God, prayer of Christians, the devil shakes. When we pray, he's wondering, what is he praying? Because he knows godly hear our prayers. Sometimes Christians ask me, you know, they ask me, Brother, uh, when I pray, I know God hears, but the devil hear? Does he know what I'm praying? And I tell them, why do you bother about the devil knowing what you're praying? In fact, I want the devil to know what I'm praying. I want him to know. Let him know my God hears my prayers. He gets even more nervous. Why are we ashamed of the devil hearing, knowing our prayers? Again, one more question people put to me is, Brother, you're speaking about thinking. I know God knows my thoughts. Does the devil know my thoughts? Does he know my thoughts? 
I tell the why are you so bothered about the devil? We put away wrong thoughts, not because the devil knows or not, or does not, but because God knows. That's why I say sometimes Christians are more bothered about devil than about God. We should be God conscious. And as we pray and as we read the Bible, as we apply scriptures and read the scriptures, we are polishing the soul, we are sharpening the soul. And devil doesn't like it. He'll try to hinder always when God's word is preached, when God's word is being read, heard, he'll try his best to interfere. Always. So be very careful about not allowing a priority in life to be disturbed by the wiles of the evil one. So first method he uses is to take our minds away from the Lord, deceive us, deceive us by taking our minds away from God into other things, reception of uh, Eve by Satan. The Apostle Paul had concern for this church in Corinth. Second method he uses is to try to make us disobey God by enticing us with sugar-coated poison, meaning sin creeping into lies deceitfully. You may be wise to handle that and say no to temptation and every iota of appearance of evil we have to stand against. He says, avoid every appearance of evil. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. The third area he will try to get us into a trap is to make us angry and lose our temper. In the book of Ephesians, letter about Ephesians, chapter 4, 26 27, we read, Paul writes, In your anger, do not sin. Not the sun go down with sin, angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Some Bible say, be angry, but sin not. Anger by itself is not sin. God also gets angry. Difference is, God is slow to anger, we are quick to anger. When God gets angry, he doesn't sin, he is full control of himself. When we get angry, invariably we speak loose words. We lose our, our, our temper. And therefore, to the Christians, Paul writes, in your anger, do not sin. Which means when you get angry, there's a possibility of sinning. And devil try to provoke us. He'll try to provoke us to lose our cool. Then what happens? We're giving the devil a foothold. A foothold. Now, let me share with you also how as God's servants, we shouldn't quarrel. When you talk about Christ to someone, very often happened with me. He's sharing gospel or sharing God's word to a fellow believer and they oppose you. How do you respond? They will want to trap us here. I tell you how he's going to trap us. Here you're sharing gospel, other person getting angry, trying to provoke you. And we lose our cool. Shouldn't lose our cool. Second Timothy chapter 2, 24 to 26. Very practical thing I'm going to share with you now. It's here it says, and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. In the hope, God done in repentance. There comes another truth. They'll come to the senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Here is sharing gospel with somebody who's under devil's control. He's opposing you, doesn't like what you're saying, trying to provoke you for you to lose your cool. And when you're not careful, not wise, then what happens is we lose our cool. What happens then? We are giving the devil a foothold. What will he do? He climb on top of us. When you give him a foothold, he climb on top of us. So he's trying to play puppet show. Here's a person opposing what you're saying. He's under devil's control, provoking you. You're getting angry, quarreling, fighting. Then you lose your cool. Give him a foothold, the devil. 
and is playing puppet show, putting two people against each other. In that process, you lose your cool, and then you messed up the opportunity of sharing the gospel. Very, very clear. Lord, servant must not quarrel, period. That's it. Practical advice. We think quarreling is okay. I'm having a discussion, healthy discussion, animated discussion, intellectual discussion, ends up in quarreling. Where's the intellect after that? Quarreling. Very simple instruction to Christians. We are a servant of God. No question of quarreling with anybody. Anybody opposes you, you gently instruct. Don't lose your cool. And devil knows he has, he has no control over us unless we allow him to have control. He can only try to work unless we allow him to work. Now people say sometimes, no, brother, everybody quarrels. Everybody has discussion. What is wrong in quarreling? Well, we are different people. It's normal to quarrel. It's human to quarrel, some people tell me. And I can't understand why I can't uh, discuss and quarrel. What's wrong in quarreling? God's words are not quarrel. Be human after all. And I tell people, be Christians. We are humans. But we are peculiar humans. We are not normal humans. We are strangers in the world. So when you're sharing gospel, such an amazing news, good news we're sharing, other man is getting angry with us. And then the devil deceives us to make us angry. You shout, he shouts, and you go away. And the whole thing is messed up. So how does one handle practically such a situation? I'll tell you what I do. When I'm sharing gospel or even talking to a Christian about God's word, if he doesn't like different doctrines God, when I share the point of view which I have, in love I speak, and they get angry. I have many times with people of other faiths. I tell them, see, what I shared with you is God's gift for you. The Lord Jesus Christ is God's gift for you. You do well to receive this gift. Salvation is in Jesus. You call upon Jesus' name, you are saved. Period. Now, you may not like what I'm saying right now. I won't fight with you. I'm a servant of God. I won't fight with you. I'm going away now. But please do yourself a favor. Remember this name. Jesus Christ. Just two words. Very simple words. Jesus Christ. Three syllables. Jesus Christ. Three syllables. So simple to remember. No? How can anyone forget that name? You may forget my name. Rajkumar Ramchandra. The name given to me when I was born was Prem Rajkumar Venkatram. Too long. Prem Rajkumar Venkatram. It became Rajkumar Ramchandra. Now very simple. Raj. I like people call me Raj. Simple. Jesus Christ. Very simple. I tell these people who fight with me. Remember this name. Any time in your life when you're disappointed, no hope in life, Resolution. People let you down. Remember this name. Call upon that name to be saved. I'm going away now. I won't fight with you. I'm not supposed to call with anybody. But do yourself a favor. Remember so many things in life you remember. So many incidents, so many happenings, anecdotes, events in your life you remember. And remember this name. Remember this name. A few seconds before you die also. You call upon that name, you will be saved. I'm going away now. I may never see you again in this world. If you call upon that name, I will see you in heaven. If you never call upon that name, I will never see you again. You get the point who's going where, you'll know that. Once what happened, I told this somebody, he got very angry. He got even more angry. So if you call upon his name, I'll see you in heaven. Otherwise, I'll never see you again. You know what he said? I don't know about that name. I will remember you. What's the point of remembering me? You forget me, you lose nothing. You forget that name, you lose everything. So very important that even in a conversation, in a holy conversation, they will not give up. They will try to provoke that person to provoke us. Don't be deceived by the serpent's cunning. It's not people you're dealing with. Spiritual forces. 
The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Getting angry is nothing wrong. But are we in control of ourselves? Are we having wisdom? Again, wisdom comes in for, for this, you know. Usually when people get provoked in their hearts, it's because of pride. You know that? Short temperedness usually because of our ego being provoked. Look at Ecclesiastes, 7th chapter, 8 and 9. Ecclesiastes 7th chapter, 8 and 9. It's written, The end of the matter is better than the beginning. And patience is better than pride. Don't be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Don't be quickly provoked in your spirit. Sometimes people put the blame on the forefathers for their short tempers. I am short tempered because my daddy is short tempered. Daddy is short tempered because grandfather was short tempered. That way, every sin you can put on Adam and Eve. Everything you say, Adam and Eve, does, that's why I'm doing. God redeemed us from that. He's made us a new creation. No excuse to say, I inherited this from my parents. No way. I'll tell you why. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 19, we read, Peter writes, It's not the perishable things such as silver or gold. You are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers. Or the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We've been redeemed from the empty way of life handed on to us by our forefathers. So it's possible that certain things in our DNA may be inherited, certain qualities, I don't know, I'm not an expert on DNA. Maybe short temper is there in the DNA. But by the blood of Christ, we have been redeemed. No excuse to say that I'm short tempered because my father was short tempered. How, does, how do you overcome pride? Very simple. Wisdom. Pride and humility are opposites. Similarly, patience and impatience are opposites. Both patience and humility come from wisdom. Come from wisdom. That's why I'm focusing so much on wisdom. James, third chapter, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Life. But these Done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Humility comes from wisdom. So if you feel you're a proud person, ask God wisdom. He will make us humble. Also, love of God manifests in humility. Look at the amazing description of love in the Bible. 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Well, from verse 4. Love is patient. Love and love of God. Also, to deal with provocative people. People provoke you normally, people get angry. We don't get angry. We shouldn't quarrel. How do you respond? The book of Proverbs, chapter 19, verse 11. Proverbs 19, 11 says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It's his glory to overlook an offense. It's his glory to overlook an offense. When people offend us, we get uh, offended when people say bad things to us, they get offended. When they insult us, we get offended. They have got to overlook, overlook their offense. When I was working for my company, uh, when I was doing a work for my American company in Russia, they are very, uh, sometimes they can be very rude. I was the only one from my company who was there. Something went wrong with our uh, collaboration with them, and I was the only representative from that company in, in Russia. And this chief of the company got very angry with me. Not my fault, but my company's fault. He began to yell at me. And in front of all his colleagues, he was yelling, yelling at me. I was listening. Kept on saying all kinds of things. Finally, he said, I'm saying so many things. Why not responding? I'm saying all these things to you. You're, you're keeping quiet. In my Bible, it says in Proverbs 19.11, a man's wisdom gives him patience. This is glory to overlook an offense. So you're offending me. I won't get offended. I will look at it. That's all. After he didn't speak one word to me. He was so embarrassed, he walked away. Not one word he spoke negatively. And by the grace of God, an amazing grace of God, 
the same company in two months' time without me knowing any Russian, without me knowing any Christian, in two months' time, 60 communists turned to Christ and got saved. The same company. Wherever we are, self-control and alert. Your enemy, the devil, mark the term enemy is a singular, it's not a plural. Your enemy, the devil, not the enemies. Pros around like a rolling lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, knowing your brothers, throw the world under the same kind of suffering. You're not the only ones are suffering in this world. All people are suffering, brothers all over the world. We don't have to fight the devil. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Look at verse 10, what a beautiful verse. And the God of all grace, who called you to eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after suffered a little while, restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So the last method he tried to use is to bring suffering in our lives and try to tempt us to question God, argue with God, complain to God, grumble against God. And that way, we lose the peace. He will deceive us to do these things. We will lose the peace of God. In Philippians chapter 2, 14, 15, 16, do everything without complaining or arguing. They may become blameless and pure. Children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation. As you shine like stars in the universe, as you hold out the word of life. When you walk in the ways of God, we will face difficulties. They will bring difficulties into our lives. They will bring suffering into our lives. We shouldn't argue, question, or complain. Can you imagine in the Old Testament, when they came from Egypt, along the way when they grumbled, and they grumbled, they were killed. God sent snakes to bite them and kill them. For grumbling, can you imagine? For grumbling. For grumbling, snakes were sent, and they died. Of course, Moses interceded, and then God provided, provided a solution. For Moses to lift up bronze snake, and then all to look up the snake, they survived. But for grumbling, they bitten by snakes and they died. Imagine today, if God were to send snakes to bite Christians and they grumble, on Sunday morning you will find the churches live snakes and dead bodies. Thank God for His grace and mercy. So no question of grumbling. May not God want the snakes today, but we will be grieving God when He grumble against. On the other hand, when He face trials joyfully and not complain, Every trial we face in this world is creating for us eternal glory in heaven, rewards in heaven. And not only that, in this world, we will refine to become more and more like Jesus, become mature and fully assured. James chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. James writes, James chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. Consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. For the testing of your faith, there is perseverance. Perseverance finishes means to recognize it, identify it, and stand against that with the wisdom and the power of God. God's wisdom is given to us to face difficult circumstances and difficult people. And the strength of God is given us for us to face. One is to know how to face wisdom. To be able to face strength. So, with wisdom and strength, we can face every crisis in life. Every crisis. God is for us. Strength to rise above every situation and reign in life through Christ. May God bless us. I'm going to close now. Leaving a few minutes for Dr. Charles to sum up and to you know, close the meeting. 5.30 will close. Just three more minutes. 6.30 here in India. God bless you all.
Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. Thank you, Raj. Um, I hope that uh, I've been brought in, but it's, it's wonderful that we are able to see how much that uh, wisdom can help us in our lives. Yes. Um, and I think it's a life journey, isn't it, until we meet that one true wise God himself. Thank you.